The topic of my research is in R, the history of it since the Neolithic period. This slide gives you the basics about cinnabar, which is the most common ore of mercury, and it comes from volcanoes and hot springs all around the world. The pigment vermilion is made from cinnabar, both synthetically and naturally. When it's made naturally, the cinnabar is heated, washed, and crushed, and the more finely ground it is and the higher degree of purity, the more vibrant the color. Based on my research identifying historical artifacts and decorative objects all around the world uh, with cinnabar and many with vermilion as well, I created a Prezi and I used historical maps as sublayers to place the objects in to provide context. One of the useful features of Prezi is that you can zoom around in whatever order you like based on the presentation path, which you see on the left there. I chose to uh, put my Prezi in chronological order. And if you stop by my table, I can demonstrate that more to you. This shows you a close-up of one of the countries, Peru. It has several funerary masks in the Mets collection that were made by numerous different pre-Columbian cultures. It also shows one segment of the Inca road that led to the Juan Velica mine, which was the largest mercury mine in South America. This shows you how you can zoom in to one particular object. Again, one in the Mets collection that's currently on display on the second floor. I was surprised to find it's actually a lot larger than it even looks. But it has the details from the Mets um, own online collection. And it, it has a hyperlink. So if you click on that, you'll go directly to the Mets webpage. I also prepared uh, a corner zoom timeline. Again, as I said, in other software with zoom capabilities. Originally, I prepared it in this fashion with the before common era and then the common era. But I then realized that I could prepare sibling timelines based on geography. And so that's what I did to try to separate it out and make it easier to analyze. This gives you an example of a sibling timeline. And once these are created, you can create what are called tours, which are like mini slideshows, where you go around and show your exhibits and the various artifacts that you have placed in the exhibits. Once again, zooming in at great detail. This shows you one of the exhibits. It's about Catahoya, the Neolithic village in Anatolia, and a variety of artifacts related to it, rock uh, wall drawings with cinnabar that were discovered there, painted bones with cinnabar that were discovered there. There are a number of pre-literate societies uh, in particular who uh, painted skulls and bones with cinnabar and used it in funerary rites. And this seems to be a common phenomena that they felt the vibrancy of the vermilion showed the freshness like fresh blood, showed immortality or the duality of life and death. And other cultures as well have used it. For example, the Romans used cinnabar to paint the statues of their gods and their gladiators to show victory. Chronosome has a nice feature when you create an exhibit, it creates a bibliography for you, and it has hyperlinks. So if you click on those, that will take you directly to your reference. And this can be used like an archive. It was anticipated to be like an expert data bank that others could contribute to over time. Finally, I just will show you these two last exhibits also from the Mets collection. These are both uh, from Greece, 
And the reason I do is because a former uh, conservator here, Elizabeth Hendricks, tested these and found traces of cinnabar. So it just shows you as we walk through the galleries and look at the beautiful artwork here, what we're seeing may be quite different than the way it, they looked in antiquity. So I hope you'll please come by my table if you're interested to hear more. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ellen. Awesome, great. Next up is uh, Blake Miller. Hey guys, we got a, we do have some room up in the front here. Maybe someone, um, if the if uh, if the Great Wave Caprice is blocking your view, feel free to move up into this middle area. That would be great. And by the way, if you guys want to tweet this out, uh, please do. Um, our Twitter handle is at MetMedia Lab. Here you go, Blake. Hey everyone, thanks for coming out. It's nice to see some familiar faces and new faces. And Matt Buttons, well, come get one at my table. Uh, so I'm just going to use the next few minutes to show you some images that give a little background of my project, and hopefully you'll come see it in person. The project's called Embodying Topographies. Um, it's really born of the question of how do we get people into the map? How do we allow them to become lost and find pleasure in finding themselves over and over again within this map or this layout that the Met becomes once you get inside the building? So you can see here in traditional museum studies fashion, my background, we have the museum's mission statement at the top, but also the Media Lab's mission statement underneath. There's a lot of parallels there, but the Media Lab really is the forward-reaching arm looking at these new interactive technologies in an experimental fashion. So much of my project is prototyping. There's a couple small errors that you'll notice only if you're really good with 3D printing. Um, but other than that, uh, move on from that. <laughs> so the beginning of my project was finding a map in the museum that was horizontally oriented. The first thing you do when you're getting directions is take the map from the visitor and turn it so that it's correct. And that helps you place yourself within the map. And I felt like this map here on the left was a really important tool that visitors were using going along the hallway by the great staircase on the second floor. Um, now, jumping from that, I looked at a map study that indicated that visitors prefer a map that includes a tilted or angled perspective of the museum to help them achieve that same place, that same amount of space within their experience. So launching off from that, I thought, what kind of tools can I make from all this technology that we have at our disposal that that replicate that experience. So I use some rendering software to look at the map's architectural files and I try to find a way that made sense in terms of stacking the floor plan on top of one another and creating some sort of effect. And it wasn't until that process that I discovered 3D printing and how easy it can be to actually achieve what I wanted to do. Um, before I show you my prototype, it's, I, I wanted to reinstate this idea that information centers around the museum could be places for reorientation. Not just a place to get more directions or more printed materials, but actually a place to feel in each wing like you know where you are, which galleries you've never seen before, how to get to those galleries, and how to get back. So the impression that we're currently, that the museum gives off as you enter is of this, this giant monolithic structure. It's not until you get inside that you see it's actually more of a cave system. When you take a tour for the first time and you're let in, it's kind of like you're going in on a spelunking expedition. And you don't really know where you're going to end up. And sometimes you'll find yourself lost at the net before you've even gone off in your own direction. So I thought how great would it be to have an exhibition model um, or a maquette in the Great Hall that shows all the space of the museum. So you can actually be able to recognize places you've never been, such as the Ovular Gallery in the America's Way in the Louvre. Oh, I think I just escaped. John? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Technology leads to <laughs> Always to my rescue. <laughs> and I wanted to preserve some elements from the map itself. So I wanted to make area specific maps um, that show different galleries and different sections of the museum, but also keep some of this dollhouse element of imagining yourself inside the space. Um, and I also wanted to launch off of materials that we already give visitors, in addition to the New Yorkers that know how to use the Met's website on their phone to look at themselves in the map, and those who use Google Earth, and those who use the maps inside the galleries. I wanted to create something new. 
So for education, I created a tool that can be handed out to school groups to help students achieve some sort of tactile spatial familiarity with the floor plan. But more importantly, my project for, volu for volunteer and visitor services allows visitors who are asking for directions about point A to be demonstrated their route through all the door frames that they'll pass by to all the columns that represent stairs and elevators to help achieve some sort of permanence um, in their familiarity with the layout. For access, I experimented with touch tactile graphics, um, and I maintained uh, the same tactile graphic map of the current touch tour through Egypt, uh, where visitors with visual impairments can actually feel some objects in the collection. It's the only place in the museum where I think all those objects are grouped together. And for design, I wanted to create models that demonstrate how easily they could produce um, exhibition models or maquettes for exhibition design or banners or new signage. And so in that, I made the facade and the Great Hall and the Lehman Wing as well. The potential for this technology is endless. This slide here from the 60s shows how slides were produced using poster board and glue and scissors. But from Kevin's project and from my facade, which is rather detailed, and this model of the Mobius strip that I found online, the, the potential for what you can do with a 3D printer is infinite. So because of that introduction, now I feel like there's more work to be done in my career. And I just want to thank Don and Marco and Norm for fixing the machine so many times, and all the supportive staff that came in and out uh, to all of our MVP, MVP presentations over the past few months um, for giving me the opportunity to become involved in this community and experience the Met in a new way. So thank you so much. And again, the Food Assistance has been a huge uh, help and supporter of us. I can't really thank those guys enough. Um, and next up is, is Keith Kirkland. I'm sure you guys have already seen the amazing stuff going on up here in the corner with this um, incredible dress. And Keith is going to tell you all about it. There's really nothing. Don't more than I can, sorry, I'm just like always flabbergasted by this project. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Keith. And um, I'm going to talk about my project today, which is Life Becomes Her. Um, to play on the exhibition that just left here about a year ago called Death Becomes Her. The purpose of the project was to give a sense of movement and animation uh, to dresses that were on exhibition. So it all started with my trip to conservation when Sarah showed me this book, which uh, being a handbag maker and an engineer, I was totally geeking out over for a really long time. Um, through four volumes of this work, she documents hundreds of dresses and clothing of historical garments and their constructions and extremely detailed notes on how to put them together. I thought this was like a gold mine. Um, but also one of the things that I realized is that people relate to clothing in a very different way than it relates to art. No one ever touches the Rembrandt, but our relationship to clothing is that you walk to a store, you touch it, you see how the fabric moves, you want to know how it feels. And I feel what Exhibitions, because of conservation purposes, we're not allowed to touch. And so it puts this thing that we're used to interacting with in a tactile and physical way into a glass box that we can't touch. So I started looking at different ways that we might be able to explore how to go about creating a sense of physicality. And weirdly, my world went extremely digital. Um, this is a, a, a product called Clothes 3D. These are not real clothes. These are rendered um, and a model renderer. Um, this is a sample of a dress that is being blown in the wind. Um, you can get really realistic fabric simulation qualities. So I started playing around, and um, through the direction of Jessica at the Costume Institute, she pointed me to V&A's work. I wanted to find a work that I could replicate to give a sense of this example of how things move. And she pointed to V&A mainly because of her work is really, really aspirational to movement. Um, it, it, it defines movement in a sense. Um, and also because um, to make sure relationships are maintained, we need some garments that were before 1923. So um, this was me trying to figure out the dress. I had the book um, from Mary yeah. Kurt. I had no idea. She's a very technical dressmaker. And so the only way I could figure out how her dresses were put together, even though I had a book and I had all the directions and I was going to model them digitally, was to make real versions to see mm -hmm. how things stuck together. It was an interesting lesson in kind of copying. And so I looked and I was like, I have all this access. I had, you know, I had a program that was really amazing. I had a whole 
team of people here that had like a vast amount of experience. And I started to begin to think, you know, with the collection of 35,000 pieces here at the Costume Institute, what if everybody had this access? And so I started to look at this idea of this pattern library. Before 1923, fashion is essentially open source. What would it look like if we could all download any pattern that we wanted, um, a dress from 1855, copy it exactly, um, or possibly even alter it for our own occasions to make it more modern? The idea of, mu of museums uh, is, is always around this topic of engagement and what engagement means. Um, I have a very intimate relationship with Madame DNA because I studied her work and I had no idea how to make sense of some of the things that she was doing. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering like, what might this mean to put the Costume Institute and the Met at the center of what could potentially be the YouTube of fashion design. Um, that's my project. Thank you very much. Awesome. Um, we also did a, a little bit of experimentation with a company called Body Labs. They have a, they're based in New York, and they have these beer and scan Wednesdays sometimes. You can go and get your, your body scanned, and then we um, talking with our, with our pal Henry about the motion tracking he's doing with supermodels and how you can apply the motion tracking of, of one animation to the body of somebody else. So I got my body scanned, so really where I want to see this project go is I want my body moving like a supermodel in a DNA dress. I think that would be a real hit for everybody. We all would want to see that. Um, so one, once more, our Twitter handle is at Met Media Lab. Um, so please, please take lots of pictures and, and tweet this out. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jen Kim, and she's going to talk about Tip Tip. Um, you want me to come over there? Hi, and thanks so much for, for being here today. I gotta say, it's been such an indulgence being in your company all the time. Um, sad to see six months coming to an end. Uh, I'll, I'll just introduce myself very briefly. My name is Jen Kim. I'm, I'm coming from the Parsons and Bay, the design and technology of Parsons in Paris. Um, I've been researching mostly display technologies and curation, mostly for the web. Um, Originally, in one of our introductory MEP presentations, I was uh, humbled by Curie Mykern. Mykern, I, I brought up the topic of recontextualizing contemporary, to which he said, you know, all objects were contemporary at some point. Um, this really brought me to the larger conversation of, you know, what is this larger story for objects within the collection, you know, aside from their time period and, and the way that we categorize them. Um, from there, I was brought to the amazing object that is the diptych. This one is from the 12th century uh, German. Uh, it actually is the Annunciation, the Crucifixion, and the Resurrection, all in this, this teeny tiny hinged object. Um, from there, I was drawn to this object because it is showing the overlying story of a larger religious theme. Um, it's a precious piece that has a physicality that you know most objects don't necessarily depict. Um, I consider it a mutable medium, and when we're so often uh, going through, you know, a browser, being overwhelmed with information, having two comparative objects with one overlying theme was very fascinating to me, and I wanted to bring it to the screen. This brought me to the interface diptych um, that explores dialogues between object pairs, you know, the tension between objects that we often miss, concerning metadata within the MMA's digital collection. We have records here for each individual object that, as you know, you know, have been compiled with 100 years or so. How, can, how does this language bring together objects? This brought me to uh, the first version of, my, of the prototype here, which was for the browser and two objects that were juxtaposed. The physical object of the diptych brought me to the interface concept, which stresses the physical limitation of the diptych, which is, you know, a, a hinge. Through the white box of a browser, here we have, you know, two sets of metadata. 
through the white box of the browser, we're able to recreate the diptych on all, on all moments through a linguistic prompt and through what we call metadata. Um, the interface seeks to explore the, the, the <coughs> unspoken dialogue and objects demonstrating implicit connections that occur within the Met's collection. And users are able to explore the collection by composing object pairs, traveling through a theme, um, going from one set of language to another. <coughs> and I'm seeing an application here for you know, connecting objects through collections, taking a specific special exhibit and bringing, drawing it closer to, to the larger collection using a single set of criteria. Um, here we're able to see you know, the more surprising aspects of not just walking through walking through the Met and having a connection between a single sculpture and that of a painting that is you know, a 10 minute walk away, but ex experiencing that surprise and that delight um, side by side either on in a physical installation or that of a project. I hope that you check, check me out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, guys, we still got some room up front if anyone wants to scoot up a bit. Maybe the folks in chairs can scoot up a little bit, and then people who are standing behind them can also move forward. So we still got a bunch of people coming in through the back, and I'm going to welcome all of them. Um, oh, this is awesome. Great. It's good, because you people who are sitting down can scoot right up, to, right up to this table that's right in front here, and you'll have a front row seat for Kevin's project, um, which I mean, Kevin has got a real knack of naming, naming his projects. Um, medieval treasures and chocolate pleasures, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hello, I'm just Kevin Yu, and uh, the process is called Medieval Treasures and Chocolate Pleasures. So, this project uh, came from many different ways, but I want to start off with my initial interest when I first came to the My interest was pretty <laughs> in the realm of design patterns through and technology. And I wanted to collaborate these different disciplines together to create some new interests. So medieval treasures and chocolate pleasures brings into harmony historical artifacts and the revolutionary technology of 3D printing and animals. Um, so let's continue. The technology exists now where you can 3D print in sugar and it's completely edible. Um, and that's pretty amazing to me. I, I think that's Pretty amazing to a lot of people because I haven't really seen a 3D printed edible art until just now uh, in real life. So I think this is the area, the era of food design where things kind of change a little bit. It's not all about decoration of existing fruits, existing veggies, or whatever it may be. It's something that you can completely design from scratch and build your own food. Um, inspiration was the rosary. So from the very beginning, I saw this at the office of, uh, well, I'll mention later on, of Pete Dan uh, Dandridge, who's the conservator of, uh, of many objects. And he had this object on his table, and I said, Pete, this is, this is it. This has intricacy. This has everything that I want, the, the religious aspects and the details, everything. And also has hinges. And I really want, would like to see two different <laughs> hinges and the food. So the possibilities began to kind of come up from there. What can I do with this object? There's all these objects that you see, especially the rosary bead, when you see it so delicate inside of a cage, um, all you want to do is touch it. Well, in this case, you can, in my head, you could touch it, and then you could hold it, you could smell it, you could eat it. And that was that was the, the mind shopping. So I want to just give a quick shout out to uh, Barbara, the, the concept. Uh, Curator of medieval arts. I don't think she's here yet. And to Pete, who has been amazing with the data sharing, um, we converted the uh, CT scans. I contacted Chris, who did the first original scans of it, and to get those models out and print. Uh, so the process: we got we picked an object. Uh, this was the object that we all agreed on. Barbara loved it. Pete loved it. I loved it. And we got the the data from the original people who scanned it, and then we were able to create this incredible model. And I was just looking at this for hours because of the, the detail. It's just amazing. Uh, this is the first sugar printed prototype that we received from 3D Systems. And 
Um, first, we just got the images, and now we have the, the actual thing here. Uh, the FDA approval has actually gone through in, in California, but if, if it comes to New York, apparently it's not uh, FDA approved yet, so nobody can actually eat this. A lot of people are asking, so I just have to say it. <laughs> yeah, maybe one link per person or something. So color templates is the, is the next thing. Um, what are the future possibilities? So right now we all see white, but the possibility was practically endless when we were talking to them on the phone. Color, smell, taste, and obviously the size were all up for consideration. So I just did a few renderings of these um, in different colors, in different transparencies. Uh, this was honey, and this is some crazy color mixture with all the, the colors of random. Um, so I just want to quickly get into this version as well. This is a collaboration where Hershey's specifically um, also ended up 3D printing edibles. So I chose, so there's a, a thing called Thingiverse where you can actually get a lot of the, the data, um, already existing 3D scans of data from the Met collection. So this is actually one of them. And I was able to take this, put it into a program, and simply cloak it with a fabric. This is actually a suggestion done given by Henry, my mentor and teacher. And uh, by doing so, the, the droplet printing was possible because the limitation of this was so um, restricted, you couldn't just print this thing on a droplet machine, it would never, never work. It would melt, it would have problems, it would just fail. So the only way to do it is to eliminate all details and all cantilever points and to have it become this blob. But the interesting thing about this is that you can create any object to be inside of that block, inside of that fabric. So this is a, uh, one of my biggest inspiration is by Alberto Bocioni, and I created my own version of the futurist sculptures. So this is one um, I kind of got inspiration from buildings, architecture, and so on. And I was able to create this, and I did the exact same thing I was doing with the previous models that I was gaining um, from Thingiverse, and was able to create this completely original piece with the object still intact inside. So if this was to be printed in droplet, you won't see what the object is, but you'll be able to feel what it is when you crunch the outer shell of the, the fabric. So that was the kind of the idea proposal for Hershey for them to utilize their droplet printing for art. So that's, that's kind of what it would be. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I could not have done this without the Met at Pratt because I'm from Pratt, and 3D <laughs> Systems was incredible. They provided all the prints. Uh, their team was amazing, California and New York. And, and Hershey's, they were supposed to provide their machine here today, but unfortunately it was sent elsewhere. But they, they were also great to work with in collaboration. So, and thank you, Don. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet project. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Abir, on that folks. Um, so yeah, uh, at, at Media Lab, um, uh, we are at FYI. We are live streaming this, so you know this is why I'm laying out all the really awesome jokes. I'm hoping I get discovered. Um, you know, so we yeah uh, we do edible food, and we also do some serious data work here. And so I'm just really excited, not only about this project and what these two guys have done up to now, but I'm also really excited to think about where this project can go and the kinds of things that it can empower for this museum uh, in the future. I was I was speaking in DC the other day, and I said, you know, uh, someone asked where where are the big uh, movements in technology for museums? Where should be museums be looking uh, in terms of uh, technology? Where they should be going? And I said they really need to be looking at what 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 the rest of the internet is all already doing. Places like Netflix, Amazon. Uh, what the advertising industry is doing, how they're using data and, and, and what people's interests are and giving them new experiences based on uh, the interests and things we already know about them. And so really tackling this kind of big data work head on is Gabriel and John. Hi everybody. Uh, our project is called My Math Recommends. I'm Gabriel. I'm a visual interaction designer. My focus is data visualization. And this is John. Hi, this is John. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a data visual educator. So we create a, a crowded source recommendation system using data already gathered from an online visitors. And also create a personalized tour map, which is based on that system. system. 
So in my map collections, we have like 100,396 users, 106,652 unique items. Okay. <laughs> so what, what is my map? Um, this is online website, um, which is run by a Metropolitan Museum, of course. And um, this is, so you can make and keep your own data, I mean, your own art collection. It's like online shopping mall. Where you can add, yeah, where, where you can add and remove any any art artworks into your uh, the cart. Yeah, so uh, the data from my map, uh, as John said, we have about a hundred thousand users and a hundred thousand unique items. Uh, but the data is is very sparse. So the items were saved by only one user, or some users are not that active. They saved only one or two items. So what we did first was to narrow down that to the most popular items, the ones that were saved by at least 50 users. So that narrows down to 2,300 items. Um, and then we built this algorithm. We didn't invent this. This is something that Amazon uh, uses as well. We just implemented it. It's called item-based collaborative filtering. Uh, and this long name, it's because it takes a list of users and the items that they are interested in, uh, say because they bought it, or in the case of my map, because they saved to their collection somehow. Uh, it reverses that to a list of items and users that saved them. And then we compare the, those lists to see what the similar items are. So say we have Jen's project here and we have Keith's project. Uh, and inside this room, say that the same 10 people only like those two projects. So there's a big chance that those two projects are very similar somehow. Um, as John said, we're not interested in, in the metadata. We're not interested in uh, what department the artworks are from. This is only based on the user's interests. And then the result is something like this. Uh, based on that first one, we have some similar items here. Uh, might be because they're from the same artist. Might be because they came from the same search result that when people search for uh, female nude painting, we cannot tell. Um, might be because they are from the, the same department. This is how the data looks like. This is just to tell you, it's very complicated, uh, just to tell you that there's a list of correlated items there from zero to one. That's like the correlation index. And our inspirations for this were uh, Amazon, for sure, it's the most popular one, uh, but also Netflix. Uh, we started to see how Netflix does the recommendations for you guys. It's, there's some transparency in it. It's not only what you might like, but it's also this is based on uh, because you watch Mad Men or because you like drama and things like that. So we we split our recommendations as well based on the item that you're seeing and the items that you already saved in your collection. And Pinterest, which is, uh, it also has some recommendations based on similar boards or similar users, and it's also a visual way to explore art. So it was a big inspiration for the UI as well. So our website structure. This is the, I mean, the second page you're going to see. Um, each rectangle, you're going to see the, uh, rent, uh, the artworks in random order. And then as you scroll down, can see like infinite artworks, like not infinite, yeah, like infinite. 2,300 <laughs> most few yeah. items. Yeah, we just call it okay. <laughs> and then in the second page, at the second page, you can, as you can see the main artwork, that's the one you actually clicked in the previous um, web, mm -hmm. the previous page. And then the uh, blue box represents the, and in the blue box, we are, we are recommending that artworks based on the main artwork. And the yellow box, we recommend those artworks based on the collections you actually chose. So if you have one artwork in your collection, and that is that main artwork, these two will be safe. So you become right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um. This is the last, like, kind of last page of our, um, our, our project. This is all items that you ha actually have chosen, and then uh, by clicking each items, you can you can also remove 
we do uh, those things. And then the last one is we can so every each so this is map, and then the the path is the shortest path of every artwork you have chosen. So and then you're gonna print that and then you can uh, bring them uh, bring them bring it to the uh, to the museum and then just walk around without get, getting lost in this huge museum. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we'd like to thank Don, Marco, the folks at the Digital Media uh, helped us a lot, especially I think with this for the feedback. And Yuda, which is another intern from the Media Lab that developed the MAT project, I think, one year ago. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, I'm really happy having done the project because it incorporates like two years of projects we have been progressing uh, regarding all the mapping stuff. Uh, a year and a half ago, we mapped the, the uh, accessibility uh, requirements for every gallery in the museum. It's, it's light levels, uh, how crowded it was, the flooring type, where all the stairs were. Next semester, Yulia comes along and writes an algorithm that says, okay, I want to see these five objects in the museum. I don't like crap. I don't like bright rooms. I can't walk upstairs. I can teach you your ideal path. And then we took that that code and built it into a little plugin that you can that any code any developer can plug right into their into their app. So if you want to use that in your app, let us know. Um, next up is Regina. Now Regina is in China. She is telepresently available from the screen over there to my right. Jess, can you full screen her? There we go. Awesome. Hi there. All right, she's in China. We're just gonna play your play your video right now, right? So you just watch watch along while everybody who's in Oz. Okay. okay, this is her this is her title screen. It's called the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Hip Hop Project, translating rap lyrics into art encounters. <laughs> My name is Regina Flores, and I'm an MFA student at Parsons. I spent the last semester interning at the Media Lab at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The project that I've made is called the Hip Hop Project. It is a curated tour of the Met using rap lyrics from the Rap Genius database, linking those lyrics to the work of art inside the museum using keyword searches through its own metadata. What really inspired me to do this project came out of a direct relationship with a group of students that I work with um, in Southside Jamaica, Queens at the Basin Housing Project. I remember the first time I told them that I was working at the museum. First of all, they had never been here. And second of all, they asked me if that was the boring museum. I think that the museum has so much to offer uh, people of all ages, and it's just about engaging them in the right way through the right way. Awesome. Thanks so much and enjoy China. Awesome. And next up is Emily McAllister, and she's going to tell us all about the Met Chrome extension. I hope you guys have all Lego voted in the back corner over there. There's still time if you haven't, um, or if that doesn't make sense. Yet. Um, so, hi, I'm Emily McAllister. Um, cool. So, this is me. Uh, I just graduated uh, as part of a first class at Cornell Tech, which is the new university that Cornell's building here in Manhattan, where I was a business student. Um, for my graduate school, I was working in film here in New York. 
So what I'm really interested in is new digital platforms for storytelling, and that was what brought me into the Met. So I wanted to look at the Google Chrome browser as an opportunity to tell a story. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Google offers Chrome extensions, which is um, different kind of little widgets that you can have uh, in your computer browser. And what I wanted to focus on was every time you open a new tab, how that could create some kind of delightful and expected experience. Um, so as you can see up here, uh, this is kind of the standard layout. Uh, there's a new tab, it's like a search bar, and your most recently visited things. Um, so this is an image from the science department. It's a Japanese woodblock print magnified at 88,000 times its original size. Voila. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually the link to the original piece in the Mets online collection. So I thought this was a really interesting relationship. And imagery like this, Typically, it's published or doesn't make it out to see uh, for other people to see. And I think there's a huge opportunity for kind of creating a larger story around each individual work of art uh, by using this imagery. So I created MicroMet, which is a Chrome extension where every time you open a new tab, you see first this image from the science department. And then if you want to learn more, you can click the title, and that'll take you to the collection online. So this is like a really fun experiment in what we can create in Chrome. And we had a lot of debates over what is kind of the most uh, most interesting experience for what you can have um, happen in a new tab. So we extended that to also create the magnified net. Uh, so this is just a magnification of any interesting detail from a different piece uh, in the museum. Again, you can click through on the title to learn a little bit more or to see kind of that little detail that I pulled out. So this is uh, more of a curated selection that I created. And then finally, we created Meowmet, which Yay. is just cats. <laughs> <laughs> so every time you open a new tab, it links to a random image from the Mets Online collection featuring a cat. Um, <laughs> I've got, <laughs> I've got it's, uh, it's actually really fun to see how, I mean, how cats have been the same since the 1880s. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I have all three prototypes over here. We've had a lot of debate over what people like, and I would love to get some user feedback. And I really would love to like take this through and release these publicly. So please come vote. Uh, you can use a Lego piece from my box of Legos to vote for your favorite one. Now. And I'm just going to vote. Thank you. I hope you all vote for cats. I don't want to sway anybody's vote, but vote for cats. Awesome. So this is great. I know you guys have all been wondering about the project in the middle here. I'm really excited to have Grace come up and tell you all about the great wave of Greece. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Grace. I'm very glad to introduce you the project that I've done in Matt. It's called the great wave of Greece. Uh, so during my internship um, here, uh, we were introduced a very great piece, the great wave, uh, the great wave in the Japanese gallery. So uh, I was very impressed by the vivid um, splashes uh, in this part, uh, in this painting. And so as I get to more about this painting, I realized that this is only one of the paintings of the uh, thir uh, 36 views of Mount Fuji done by the same uh, Japanese artist. So, uh, and uh, also uh, all these paintings about all the different perspectives and stories of this mount. And uh, so I was thinking, uh, I was uh, I'm always interested about um, how to, uh, the, to explore the way of viewing the 2D paintings in museums. And since uh, this series of paintings is all about perspectives, so why don't I just put all these paintings together in a 3D piece to recreate this 3D structural projection for people to see these paintings in a different way? So I had this installation uh, in the middle of this room, as you can see. So um, uh, instead of, uh, we will, uh, because traditionally when we will the uh, 2D paintings, we stand still right in front of the paintings one by one. So uh, since it's a series of paintings, so you can actually walk around this installation. And uh, uh, in this uh, installation is uh, just one projector, and uh, there is an upside down pyramid structure to hold the mirrors to uh, split the projector into four different directions. So there are four pieces of the paintings uh, in this series, and uh, you can see that uh, in different angles as you walk around this installation, it will be different paintings. And uh, 
in this um so in this uh, laptop uh, this is the map projection of the real things on the 2d screen and uh, when you are actually interact with this painting in the using the trackpad you can also see that there will be some splash effects because it, it is a great wave so when you are interact with the waves you can see the wave is real, uh, really moving so with all of these effects uh, i really want to explore um, the different way of viewing 2D paintings in museums. Um, in one way, it's uh, you can walk around in this 3D space as well. Uh, it seems like there is a Mount Fuji in the middle, uh, in the in the middle of, of the space. And also, I want to see that how this uh, dynamic way could add another layer to these 2D paintings and to explore some fun things out of it. And. Uh, that's it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Grace. It's really inspiring to see you put all of this together, too. Really great to watch. Um, awesome. Next up is, uh, if you guys got here before we started with the presentations, you saw some awesome fun happening up on the screen. If you guys know anybody who's like 12 years old, I'm sure you're very familiar with, uh, with uh, Minecraft, which is the topic of Brian's presentation. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Brian Hughes. I'm a media studies and media theory student at Queens College in the new media studies uh, master's program, uh, which means we need to uh, take very detailed notes or we tend to go off on uh, long occult tangents. Um, so, it's hard to do with three different things. Metcraft. <laughs> Metcraft is the first step uh, in. I'm sorry. Yeah, tell me next. That's what it is. Thank you. Uh, is the first step in gamifying the Metropolitan Museum using uh, the gaming platform of Minecraft. So, what is Minecraft? Uh, those of you with children uh, likely know the answer to that question already. Uh, Minecraft is one of the most popular open-ended gaming platforms in the history of video games. It's Legos on a massive scale, uh, a massive multiplayer online sandbox uh, where users build and explore a fully interactive world. And they can even invent entire worlds of their own. Now, I call it a gaming platform rather than just a game because the world of Minecraft is easily manipulable, uh, even down to its physics. You can customize the landscape, the architecture, you can even customize the weather. You can create entire video game length adventures which are then publicly shareable. And the makers and manufacturers, to their credit, really understand the value of this um, extreme level of interactivity, and they even encourage it uh, in the users. Um, this has resulted in really a rich culture uh, growing up around the Minecraft platform. Um, the, the technical and, dare I say it, mythopoetic creativity <laughs> on display uh, in the Minecraft community is, is really, really stunning. And it is very popular. Uh, actually. Okay, so you can see these statistics. Uh, there are 27 million players uh, worldwide. 43.7% of those are age 15 to 21, and another 20 plus percent are under the age of 15. So that's the next generation of museum goers, uh, both here in New York City, uh, the United States, and in the world at large. So. The initial idea for Metcraft actually came to us uh, when we had some visitors come to the Media Lab from a girls' hacker space in Las Vegas. And uh, we were showing them around the lab. Don was showing them around the lab, I should say. And you know they were quiet uh, to the point of being monosyllabic, which is sort of how teenagers are, uh, until somehow, and I don't even remember how it happened, somehow the word Minecraft got drunk. And they would not stop talking about Minecraft. They just kept, the, the excitement was really uh, uh, phenomenal. And we decided that this is something that we had to look into. Uh, so other museums have been exploring Minecraft. Obviously, this is the Great Hall uh, here at the Met. Uh, but the British Museum has been doing work with Minecraft. Uh, MoMA has been doing work with Minecraft. The Tate has been. Uh, doing more work with Minecraft, and they all have their own uh, unique spin on it. 
And so, so we decided that the Met spin on this could be to approach it as an educational tool and uh, outreach games. So let me give you a sketch of what I came up with. All right. Imagine, if you will, uh, it's a Saturday morning. Uh, this is for um, a Saturday education program, say for children age 8 to 11. Uh, what we do is we give them a packet, uh, a gallery scavenger hunt that has images of art objects uh, with space then to uh, take down notes. And we take them to the Greek and Roman galleries. We say, find all of these objects, write down their names, and uh, as many facts about them as you can. And when you when you finish, uh, come back to the lab, come back to the library, and we're going to play a game. And that's when we log them on to MetCredit. And uh, what we've done so far, there's still a lot, a lot of room to grow, uh, but what we've done so far is we've recreated the entire first floor of the Met uh, on the Minecraft platform. Uh, first they go to the Greek and Roman galleries uh, in now the Minecraft world, uh, where they answer a series of quizzes, so to speak, uh, at, based on what they've learned during their scavenger hunt. If they answer the questions correctly, they collect a suit of armor, a sword, and a code that will get them into the Egyptian land. If they answer the questions incorrectly, then uh, secret doors open up, monsters come out, they chase them around, and if the monster catches them, then they have to start over. Uh, here we have the Egyptian wing. Once they've completed the, the quiz uh, and, and shown that they were paying attention and engaged and uh, you know, were learning, they get to do a what we call a dungeon crawl style adventure through the Egyptian wing. Uh, so here they have to jump over lava. Um, there are skeletons that appear and chase them around who they can fight off. Uh, there are more puzzles, there are more mazes until eventually, there's one more, they find themselves here at the Temple of Dendron. Uh, once they're here, they receive the keys to unlock the entire rest of the museum and uh, from there, it's, it's free play. They can do pretty much whatever they want uh, throughout the rest of the museum. They can build and explore as they would uh, in any other Minecraft game. So there's uh, a lot more that we can do. Uh, honestly, I'd love to see this uh, continue growing. In the next couple of months, uh, I would love to see Minecraft moved on to its own dedicated server so that we can complete some in-game modifications and so that the public can now be incorporated into testing and crowdsourcing some of the projects. Uh, this is really just one application of Minecraft um, towards museum education and outreach. So uh, I'm really excited to see where this could go. And I think that the Met is really uniquely positioned to explore this um, as an educational tool. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, like everyone else, I need to echo thanks to, uh, to Don and to Marco all the staff and everyone who came to all the uh, MVP presentations, uh, and of course to my fellow interns, it's really been amazing and inspiring to be around so many uh, creative and, and brilliant people. So thanks a lot, guys. Excellent, awesome. And that brings us to our last but not least presenter. Um, uh, Isabel Pace is going to tell us all about the interactive music bench. I'd like to remind you, if any of you guys have teenagers, or if there are any teenagers in the audience, next Friday is Teens Take the Met. It's an event that's going to be taking place all over the museum, full of activities for kids ages you know, 13 to 17. It's going to be loads of fun, and, um, and Isabel's project is going to be featured in that as well. So take it away. Thank you very much. Hey, okay, so my name is Isabel. I'm a student in the Interactive Telecommunications program. And when I first started uh, this internship, one of my biggest inquiries was how can I empower the works of art inside the museum through technology and through the tools that I'm using in school and I'm learning in school. And I wanted to design an experience that will grab the visitor's attention and will enhance the atmosphere and the works of art inside the gallery. So I decided to continue uh, with a piece I did last semester that's a music bench designed to persuade human collaboration and interaction. This, is a, this uses a, a, a song that is divided into different instruments. So each stage is an instrument in the song. 
So when four people are sitting together, you listen to the whole piece. Otherwise, you just listen to a couple of the instruments. And so the trick was how can I reinvent this to fit inside the gallery? And and specifically, I was working for the medieval gallery because for the event that Don just mentioned, since they the men, they want to have a music bench inside the medieval gallery. And so the trick here was how can I uh, get a song that will fit into the gallery? So I was uh, working and I was looking to collaborate with musicians. I was looking through the sound cloud of the Metropolitan Museum and I bumped into a couple of posts and a couple of compositions by this cellist composer, John Jean Renault. And, and she was, I wrote to her and I told her about my project here, and she was very interested in collaborating with me in this project. And, and, okay, so this will not be the first time music is used inside the gallery space to enhance the atmosphere. There has been a couple of exhibitions inside the museum that they use in music, especially right now. And China Through the Looking Glass, that's an amazing exhibition that's right now. If you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. And I really think that the music that they use all over the exhibition um, enhances the experience of the visitor. And you really connect more with the works of art that you're seeing, with the gallery space and everything. And music, I think, is a key part of the, of the success of that exhibition. And yeah, so. That's it. Uh, come try my music page here. It's the only one that doesn't have any lights or screens. So I can tell it is if you can't find it. <laughs> yeah, so please stop by and I would love to hear your comments. And I want to thank Don and Mark also for this amazing experience. And thank you so much. <laughs> And so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of things to go around. It took a lot of people to pull this event together. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, this has been really, really a thrill for me to for me to now work with all of these people to put these things together and share these kinds of things with you. I'm sorry, I have to take a picture of all of you guys. This is the thing I used to do in my band days. Everybody wave. Yay! Okay, awesome. Um, again, I want to thank um, all of our technology partners. The Media Lab is really fortunate in that the New York has this amazing creative technology industry. We have these companies that are willing to spend time with us, donate uh, donate their time, donate their skills, donate their equipment to making these projects happen because they uh, you know they dig the community that we we built up in this space. 3D Systems has been amazing. Uh, Body Labs, Clue 3D, Electric Objects. These uh, the diptych. Screens on the right are provided by Electric Objects, our new startup, um, making digital art screens that you hang on your wall. I'm really excited about that stuff. Hershey's has been a lot of fun to work with. Um, all of our school partners, like Parsons and Pratt um, and ITP, have all really been um, amazing. It's fabulous working with all of those educators. Um, huge thanks to all of the, the Met staff that make these things happen, our media services and our catering people that make this space work. Um, our education department has been so instrumental in giving really crucial feedback about our about these projects, talking about us, about our audiences and how we evaluate and learn more about our visitors. Um, our, our design department has done amazing work with us, helping us produce a lot of stuff at the last minute, which is not how they like to work. So <laughs> big thanks to those guys. Uh, the digital, our digital media department, our senior management, popular link, Streets Unit Boston and Low Talent have been incredibly supportive of us kind of doing everything the wrong way here, as far as the med is concerned. Um, the amazing Media Lab community, we have uh, you know 70 odd volunteers and interns who have come to our doors. We still come in on a regular basis to help out with projects uh, and lend their skills and support. And really none of this would be possible without any of those people. And I know a lot of you are in the audience right now. So give yourselves a hand and please let's all give. <laughs> And then we're just the fun part of the intro, where you guys get to really get up close with all these projects, talk to these, uh, talk to these creators one on one, share your ideas. We're really interested in your feedback. All of these are prototypes. These are not finished projects. They're really the start of a conversation. And we have, we really want to um, take notes. We really want to hear your feedback. We want to hear the good and the bad, and where you think these projects might go. Maybe in this museum. Maybe in another museum. Maybe somewhere else. 
uh, maybe somewhere else online. Um, we really want to um, uh, further further all of these projects and really create a conversation. So um, with all of that said, I'm going to shut up. The hashtag is at Met Media Lab. Uh, we have two survey um, podiums over here on my right, right in the middle, right next to the Hip Hop Project. Please, before you leave, Perfect. please fill out the survey form. If you want to give a fake email address, you can, I guess. Um, but we'd love to hear your feedback on what you really liked and didn't like. Or if you just want to leave your email address so you can get, get on our announcement list about the next time we're doing events, that's great too. We really just want to be able to connect with all of you and continue the conversation uh, past just today, these few hours. Thanks all so very much. Um, and, and before, um, lest I forget, None of this would really be possible without the amazing input of Marco Castro. I mean, we have a great time. Thank you so much. I have a great time for you, man. Thank me. Marco, you're awesome. Thank you so much. Um, guys, please enjoy the rest of the expo.